Thank you, Dan, uh, for the introduction and for inviting me here. Uh, Dan is one of the only people in Vancouver that calls me Tom. Very sweet. That's so great. Uh, anybody can call me that. Um, uh, so, what I, I did not prepare a formal paper here. I thought we would have somewhat more of a discussion. I have some points to make around uh, the central text that I want to um, focus on. I want us to focus on today uh, part five of the history of sexuality, um, <clears throat> the right of death and power over life, which for me is Foucault's uh, key text. I think everything converges in Foucault from the very beginning of his work in the 50s to the very end of his work in the early 80s. I really do think everything converges on these uh, 20 pages or so. I'm going to speak around them, however, um, and I'm going to speak around them in light of a new fashionable uh, topic and concern over the sources and genealogies of neoliberalism. Now, um, I've organized the talk in the, my remarks, um, which I'll take about 40 minutes at the most to make. Um, around three distinct uh, topics, as you see on the handout. If anybody needs a handout, there's more back there where Dan is. Neoliberal dreams, and I'm going to take the concept of dream quite seriously back to Freud. Neoliberal biopolitics, and that'll be sort of the, the centerpiece of uh, my remarks um, from a core pa a key passage in this part five of the History of Sexuality, volume one. And then finally, where I think that's going in terms of uh, um, what's come to be called bio or neoliberal biosociality through the work of Nicholas Rose, Paul Rabineau, and a number of other thinkers. So, what do we mean by when we hear the word neoliberalism today? We tend to think of late 20th century uh, politics, theories, practices from the 1970s to the 1990s. Um, often it's dated to, in the contemporary form, to uh, the Pinochet coup d'etat in Chile in 1973, the first 9-11. I do recommend the film down the road here, um, uh, No, um, which uh, tracks a later, uh, um, um, first, a later uh, development of that in the um, plebiscite on Pinochet's regime but also the rise of a market economy, a market socialist economy in China with Deng Xiaoping, and then finally really established um, in a neoliberal counter-revolution of Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, then a counter-counter-revolution um, in Clinton, uh, up to Obama with a couple of bushes in between. Um, David Harvey has written the, the sort of definitive history, short history of neoliberalism, and there he defines it as a theory of political economic practices that proposes that human well-being and capacities, what was already formulated as human capital in the 1950s, can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework that fosters private property, rights, individual rights, free markets, and competitive trade. So neoliberalism, as, as it's now become almost uh, common sense, not just economic doctrine or political dogma, but a kind of general consensus and everyday common sense, um, has come to mean uh, 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 an entrepreneurial individual um, ethos of which, Garrett, which is, uh, takes place within a context of free markets, uh, free trade, private property. Now, Harvey's great intervention into uh, the history of, the critical history of neoliberalism is to formulate it as accumulation by dispossession, which is really just a reformulation of Marx's concept of primitive accumulation, the accumulation of the, of, uh, the countryside, of the commons, by um, the middle classes of the 17th and 18th centuries, um, and the marking off of 
private property through the enclosure movement. Harvey's argument is that, is that the latest phase of neoliberalism is uh, a kind of shock therapy which has taken place through uh, the creation or the restoration of class power. And he traces this through, um, through uh, kind of what he calls an uneven geographical history, history of the present, which he looks at the uh, US, the UK, China, Sweden, Latin America, and so on. The basic narrative here is, uh, narrative theme is the commodification of everything. <laughs> Already Mar Marx's idea, right? That the basic principle of capital is uh, the capacity to turn all use values into exchange values and to trade them on the market. And now we see anything and everything, not just labor power, but life itself as the subject and object of this commodification of daily life um, and financialization of everything. So those are the kind of watchwords of the new neoliberalism, but they might just as well be um, taken out of chapter one, volume one of Marx's Capital. The difference is that they become less the, the insight of a guy, Marx, working away in uh, uh, the British Library and more of a, um, of a kind of common sense. Everything can be bought and sold. Um, <clears throat> all right, so that's sort of what we mean where we, where we talk about neoliberalism today. And what I want to talk, what I want to track, my, my question today, which I'm hoping some of you can help me figure out, but I'll tell you how far I've gotten with it, is to try to find out why Michel Foucault dedicated his 1978-1979 lectures to the theme of what he called the birth of biopolitics. And he actually spends no time talking about biopolitics, because he says, I got completely distracted. I got no further than the introduction of the, into this theme of biopolitics. We'll get into that in a second. Um, and he ends up just talking about neoliberalism. And he's writing at the end of the 1970s, interestingly, or talking, rather, to a large group of students at the Collège de France, Overflow House. And, uh, and he's able to just sort of wing it, as I'm going to kind of do today. Okay. Uh, he's got some notes. There's definitely manuscripts here. And I have, believe it or not, some papers, some manuscripts that I decided to leave at home and write up in note form to see where else we could go with this. But I want to figure out why Foucault would end up talking about neoliberalism of the middle of the 20th century, the Chicago School of Neoliberals in the 20s and 30s, which he juxtaposes with and shows intellectual networks and connections with the Freiburg School of Ordo Liberalism in the same decades, the 1920s and 30s. That's pretty much what almost two-thirds of these lectures are taken up with. So he does get distracted, and yet, even by the end of the course, he he's, keeps the same title and uh, leaves it for us to make the link to what he had previously, a few years earlier, in part five of the History of Sexuality, volume one, uh, had called biopolitics. Okay? So there's been a... Before I get to that, there's been sort of a wave of, uh, of writing uh, recently on the uh, tra tracking genealogies of biopolitics. So genealogy is a Foucauldian word that is basically a way of saying that we're too lazy or too self-interested to do history, proper <laughs> history. Seriously. Uh, and it's a great thing, because I love when my students do that, because I don't want them to spend four chapters of their thesis talking history. I want them to get to the point. <laughs> and that's what we're doing now with the genealogy of neoliberalism. And I want to track that to certain developments, not just in the middle of the 20th century, but to the middle and end of the 19th century, which is where my uh, area of expertise and point of interest lies. Well, my colleague in the geography department, Jamie Peck, has written a um, very well-received and beautifully written book, Constructions of Neoliberalism, published in 2010. And there he 
he basically develops a thesis that neoliberalism can't really be defined, and that's partly what makes it interesting and what makes it uh, problematic. He calls it a hybrid ideology and utopia. Um, advancing a dream of politically assisted market rule. Okay? Now I want to take up that idea of the dream um, uh, by way of introduction to um, what, we're, what I want to talk about in Foucault. It's a dream of politically assisted market rule or a dream of naturally self-regulating markets. So the idea of a naturally self-regulating market is that the, what Freud might call the navel of this dream, okay, at the center of this dream. What could be self-regulating about the markets? Well, Peck, following other people, including um, David Harvey and others, tracks that dream, that neoliberal dream, to a couple major reference points. And this is very useful. You're going to see this coming up. Just like in the old days, we all went crazy over postmodernism, and we tried to catch up with that. And then we went crazy over maybe cosmopolitanism. Um, now it's all about neoliberalism. So you're all right on, right on, uh, uh, on point here. Well, what were the key pivotal historical moments or points or nodal uh, or networks? Well, there's the Mont Pelerin Society meeting in 1947, and that's a m meeting of, uh, of economists from the United States, from Germany, from Austria, from England. The major institutions there are the London School of Economics in England, the University of Chicago in the United States, and Freiburg University, and to some extent, the University of Vienna in, uh, on the continent. Um, uh, part of that is, includes these Freiburg uh, economists. Um, they founded a journal, which is uh, the focus of much of Foucault's lectures here, a good 200 pages of, this, of, these, uh, of these lectures, a journal which in German uh, is the Jahrbuch für die Ordnung von Wirtschaft und Gesellschaft, the yearbook for the ordering or regulation of the economy and society. Now that's significant because there's not really a political project here, and yet the whole uh, reason for being of this uh, journal is to steer a course between authoritarian uh, fascism on the one hand, Included, as well as authoritarian socialism and a kind of liberal social democratic welfare uh, state policy. The Freiburg intellectuals or Ordo liberals um, uh, were trying to steer a course between those two extremes of, of sheer um, classical liberal, laissez faire, um, uh, free market fundamentalism and uh, authoritarian, fascist, and socialist, state-managed, centrally planned economy. Something between that. There at Mount Pelerin in 1947 and many years after for the, in those meetings. Um, at, along with them in the 1920s and 1930s, also meeting in Mount Pelerin in uh, 1947, are what has become to be known the Chicago Boys. Okay. So uh, Herbert Simons, Milton Friedman, um, the latter you might have heard of because he was advisor to, uh, to Ronald Reagan, as well as to Barry Goldwater, among, among, among other uh, neoconservative neoliberals. So that's the curious thing about neoliberalism is that it finds alliances with neoliberal uh, neoconservative ideological politicians and movements. Um, but what's interesting about this kind of confluence of meetings and schools, Freiburg School, Chicago School, is how it becomes, is, is how it sort of expands out from these intellectual nodal points and networks. Um, and at the same time combines principles and prejudices with practices. Peck's 
formulation of this, these, this waxing and waning of liberal doctrines and um, dogmas through the 20th century, centering on the response to the Great Depression and then the, first world, uh, the Second World War, is what he calls a double movement in which liberal free market practices um, progress and retreat. And he formulates this movement very usefully in terms of the strategy of roll back and roll out. So liberalism rolls back, and this is some of us uh, of my generation are just a bit younger, we'll certainly have deep memories of this from the 1980s. It's a period of destroying the welfare state, deregulating of fiscal controls to cut back inflation, to, con to engage in uh, a variety of cutback measures. So cut back social services, smash unions. That's a roll back phase or strategy of neoliberalism as Peck uh, outlines it. That's complemented by a roll out. A roll out is a kind of uh, um, regeneration, revitalization of the state for the purposes of a creative stimulus of the market and of the economy. A kind of proactive reform which uh, promotes public-private partnerships, state market hybrid forms, um, domestically and maybe outsourcing um, and other kinds of things that are, uh, internationally. So this double movement raises the question of how, in what sense is neoliberalism paired with neoconservatism or classical liberalism? Um, does it come after or does it just add something or does it add something new? Which of those is it? Um, here's uh, Peck's thesis. So this is my first uh, quotation here. Neoliberalism, he says, has only ever existed in impure form indeed can only exist in messy hybrids. Its utopian vision of a free society and free economy is ultimately unrealizable. Yet the pristine clarity of its ideological apparition, the free market, coupled with the endless frustrations born of the inevitable failure to arrive at this elusive destination, nevertheless confer a significant degree of forward momentum on the neoliberal project. Ironically, neoliberalism possesses a progressive well, neoliberalism possesses a progressive forward-leaning dynamic by virtue of the very unattainability of its idealized destination. In practice, neoliberalism has never been about a once and for all liberalization and evacuation of the state. Instead, it has been associated with rolling programs of market-oriented reform, a kind of permanent revolution which cannot simply be judged according to its own fantasies of free market liberation. So I want to take this imaginary construct of the dream of, of a permanent revolution in the market, permanent revolution in society, of self-regulating entrepreneurs, individuals, uh, market systems. I want to figure out, unpack that a little bit. And to do that, I want to move back then as Foucault does back in time to the origins and sources of neoliberalism in the age of classical liberalism. So this is really the focus of most of Foucault's work, as you know. Um, most of what he was writing in the 60s and 70s uh, was focused on the period from the late 18th century to the middle or sometimes as late as the almost the end of the 19th century. So about a one uh, century period in European history. That's pretty much what he focuses on for the core, what we think of as the core of his, uh, of his career. Um, as I noted, he starts moving away from that with these lectures here from 1978 to 1979. And then that's, it's about at this point, just after a sabbatical that he took, that he starts moving even deeper back into uh, classical um, Roman Greek history, early church history, uh, to interrogate what he calls the 
uh, hermeneutics of the self, technologies of subjectivity, and so on. All part of uh, within and in many ways expanding well beyond his, uh, his uh, multi-volume project on the history of sexuality, um, of which uh, he only lived to see published uh, the first introductory volume. Um, <clears throat> But Foucault has already introduced the concept of biopower, biopolitics, uh, at least as early as 1974, if not earlier, in a lecture he gave in, um, uh, um, I think in Brazil, on the birth of social medicine. He tracks the, the emergence of the regulation and control over life at various levels, <clears throat> individual, macro-social, uh, through the state, through the city and of the labor force to regenerate, uh, revitalize a labor source uh, pressed into the service of capital. What, he's, what interests him here is the project for so much of French thought, um, as I tell my undergrads, think of the French as people really concerned with liberty. <laughs> not so much equality, not so much solidarity, as much as liberty, at least the French a uh, certain strain of it. Now, I know that's uh, being challenged by people like Rancière and others recently. But Foucault's asking, as he does right at the end of the text that uh, um, uh, I, I gave you today, he says, the, honor, the irony of this deployment, and here he's talking specifically about the deployment of sexuality, but also more generally of what he calls biopower in this final section. The irony of this deployment is in having us believe that our liberation is in the balance. And I think it's that, that irony that Foucault picks up on when he, uh, picks, when he revisits the problem of biopolitics uh, a few years after the publication of The History of Sexuality in 1976, um, when he uh, um, uh, presents his uh, series of lectures at the Collège de France in the fall of 1978. Well, here he takes up, as I said, the problem as it's posed in the middle of the 20th century, in the first instance. That is by the Ordo liberals, the Germans, or rather, yeah, the Germans in Freiburg, and the Chicago School neoliberals um, uh, writing and thinking at the same time, and many of them actually engaging in a certain kind of transatlantic dialogue. There the question is, how can the state not just control and contain um, an unruly and dynamic market, but how can it harness it? How can it actually um, provide a, com a positive stimulus for the growth and expansion of the market? So the, mar the state doesn't just become a kind of night watchman or supervisor, a, a kind of panoptic mechanism of surveillance. It does do that, but it rather, does so under the supervision of the market itself. As Foucault puts it kind of famously here, he says, the project then is to retask, not just restrain, but retask the state under the supervision of the market, rather than a market supervised by the state, which is the task of classical neoliberalism. So, so how to enhance and foster and channel Competition is the problem for uh, the neoliberal state. And especially in the middle of the 20th century, the question is not how only to roll back the state, how to allow it to wither away, how to help it disappear, but rather how to make best use of it in the service of market competition. Okay, so that takes us now into the center of the historical and conceptual problematic, I would say, of the history of sexuality, volume one, as Foucault outlines it, um, uh, in, especially in this fifth part. There I would say, um, following on his first book, his earlier book, just a year, a year before, The Discipline and Punish, um, he's trying to think through what the project of Bentham's Panopticon has meant um, for the rise of uh, capitalist industrial society. 
In short, I'd say that he's tracking the effects of, of, Benth of the combination of Bentham's panopticon and Adam Smith's invisible hand. So Bentham's panopticon at the level of the body, of the level of the individual who can be trained and uh, surveyed into regulating her and himself, and at the level of the society as a whole, the, the, the function of an invisible hand to regulate an entire population. Now, in between the 1790s and the 1890s, which is my particular concern, which I'll show you in a second, is Darwin and the origin of species in, 17, in 1859, and Marx and Capital Volume 1 in 1867. Darwin defining the struggle for existence and the problem of both natural and artificial selection um, as, his, as the problem of ev evolution. As he says in the preface to uh, The Origin of Species, 1859, he says, my task is to show how the doctrine of Malthus, that is Thomas Malthus and his principle of population, a text of political economy, how the doctrine of Malthus can be applied to the whole of animal and vegetable kingdoms. So that I find really interesting as someone tracking the history of social science, that, the, that this pivotal paradigm smashing moment in the history of the biological sciences finds its inspiration in the social sciences, in political economy, the political economy of populations. So the principle of survival, of, not the survival of the fittest, but of the struggle for existence, of selection. Um, D Darwin first sees in the human world and then finds, tries to find how that plays out in the um, animal and vegetable kingdoms, as he puts it. And I also find it really significant that the first chapter of The Origin of Species is not on natural selection, but on artificial selection. It's about pigeons, okay? It's a quaint little British uh, obsession, collecting breeding pigeons. And he says, on this tiny little scale, we can see how life itself undergoes through a microscope, through the cage of the, of the pigeon uh, collector, whatever they're called, bubbling in there life itself. And what I think that introduces is that problematic of the control over life itself, the manipulation and management of life, even though that's not his topic. It's there by way of preface, by way of mere analogy, by way of allegory even, very loosely, but it's still, it's there at the beginning of this absolutely pivotal text. A second, a second point is Marx, and what I'm gonna say is that Marx, at the same time as he's developing a labor theory of value, he's also developing a life theory of surplus value. That is, of life which produces more life, which more life which can be appropriated, manipulated, controlled, reinvested. So Marx is actually developing, I think, a kind of theory of biocapital through the idea of the species as a work, as, as a work in progress, the human species as a work in progress, and as a project of self-creation. And that you can get from some of the early Marx. Okay, now fast forward a couple de decades to the late 1890s. So the sort of artificial structure of my thinking here is to move from the 1790s with Bentham and combining that with uh, um, Adam Smith from a few uh, decades before to the 1890s, and I've already framed that a bit to the 1990s with Reagan and Thatcher, right? So that's sort of our little genealogy if you want to track it in terms of decades separated by centuries. Right, what's happening in the 1890s? Amazingly, a lot. I and mean, if you know, if you're a nerd like me and you just have been reading for too long, then you see almost everything was written or thought in the 1890s. <laughs> Freud's interpretation of dreams, 
Zimmel's Philosophy of Money, Durkheim's Division of Labor in Society. Um, anybody else want to add one? Um, <laughs> Spencer's Principles of Sociology. Um, Weber's uh, Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism is, is, Capitalism is conceived there out of his studies of financial and agricultural policy. Um, and so on and so on. What I want to focus on is first the basic frame I think that's been provided by Freud's project for a scientific psychology where he has a kind of, I would call a kind of neuroscientific dream of the human psyche um, governed by synapses and um, so on, which he then morphs into a theory of dreams and the dream work, the longest uh, almost 300 page chapter of his uh, path-breaking interpretation of dreams, which focuses on the processes of condensation and displacement of the day's residues. So a dream is never anything that's completely unhinged from reality. It's always a reworking of reality. And that's what interests me about this idea of the dream of neoliberalism. It's never just a utopian or ideological dream completely free-floating from practices and realities. It's always built into and combined with those in the way that Freud conceived of those. A second is Zimmel, as I said. Zimmel's um, developing his own, what we now like to think of as a kind of Leben Soziologie, a kind of life sociology, complemented by a life philosophy that he was to, to develop in uh, contemplation and dialogue with uh, Bergson and others in the late 19th and early 20th century. His basic theme there is the idea of the life drive. He even says life Lebenstrieb as a kind of force of sociability. So the life drive is, drive is our capacity, our built-in capacity to be sociable, uh, form-giving, form-adapting um, groups and individuals through variation and differentiation. And then finally, Herbert Spencer, writing from his principles of sociology from his 1870s to the early 1890s, um, who develops a kind of Darwin-inflected and inspired theory of the evolution of societies, of society, of human society itself, from militarism, um, which preserves itself in struggles and uh, uh, um, advances itself through defense and um, uh, immunity to industrialism, which uh, develops and um, advances itself through regulation and control. And in some ways I think of Spencer as the great father of neoliberalism, building ne neoliberalism out of a classical liberalism of uh, Mill and um, Bentham, I would say. So here's why I think that. Here's Spencer writing in the principles of, uh, of sociology. I'm sorry I didn't put this one up here. We're getting to our Foucault quote. Don't worry. Uh, as the contrast between militant and industrial types, remember there's a shift, he says, from sort of militant, uh, aggressive societies to more peaceable industrial societies, the classic <coughs> trope in sociology classical sociology, to repeat, as the contrast between militant and industrial types is indicated by inverting the belief that individuals exist for the benefit of the state into the belief that the state exists for the benefit of individuals, so the contrast between the industrial type and the type likely to be involved from it, after the industrial type, is indicated by the inversion of the belief that life is for work into the belief that work is for life. Okay. Now you've heard that pretty recently, right? I don't live to work, I work to live, right? And that's, ben, that's Spencer writing in the 1870s already. But then he hedges and steps back, as these guys tend to do, by saying, but here, but we are here concerned with inductions derived from societies that have been and are and cannot enter into speculations regarding uh, societies that may be. There's your speculative history brain. So he's sort of held himself back from actually constructing a speculative history of what a post-industrial neoliberal society might look like. But if we did have to give it a formula, 
it would be one where we don't live to work. That's industry, that's the industrial society, liberal society of the 19th century, but we work to live. And it's the question of what that living is that I think is at the center of Foucault's project, okay? So, without further ado, let's get to the central passage in Foucault, the second one here. And I'll explain my little diagram there, because I have to have a diagram. Um, in concrete terms, this is Foucault writing on page 139. In fact, if I had to say that there's one passage in Foucault that you just have to spend your life thinking about, it's this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, in concrete terms, starting in the 17th century, this power over life evolved in two basic forms. These forms were not antithetical, however. They constituted, rather, two poles of development linked together by a whole intermediary cluster of relations. One of these poles, the first to be formed, it seems, centered on the body as machine, its disciplining, the optimization of its capacities, the extortion of its forces, the parallel increase of its usefulness and its docility, its integration into systems of efficient and economic controls. All this was ensured by the procedures of power that characterized the disciplines and anatomopolitics of the human body. The second, formed somewhat later, focused on the species body, the body imbued with the mechanics of life and serving as the basis of the biological processes propagation, births and mortality, the level of health, life expectancy, and longevity, with all the conditions that can cause these to vary. Their supervision was affected through an entire series of interventions and regulatory controls, a biopolitics of the population. The disciplines of the body and the regulations of the population constituted the two poles around which the organization of power over life was deployed. Now, what I'm, in this little crude diagram I have there, I'm actually trying to play to uh, map that out in terms of what I see happening in the late 19th century with Freud, Spencer, and Zimmel on two planes. So I'm constructing this kind of fancifully as kind of the dream book, Traumbuch, as Freud called his interpretation of dreams the dream book of neoliberalism. It's not neoliberalism, but it's neoliberalism in Nietzsche. It's sort of being born here. Okay? On the one side, on the biophysical plane, we have a focus on the organism through the process of selection, and this is a mutual selection of organism and its milieu. We have the environment, characterized by competition, and finally, equaling, combined, making up the survival of the fittest. And if you don't know, then, then it's useful to know that Darwin borrowed that phrase from Spencer, okay? So there's a kind of mutual borrowing there. There's Spencer borrowing from Darwin, and then Darwin borrowing from Spencer in subsequent revisions of the origin of species and, um, and in the later works. Um, Did they know each other? No, I think, I assume they did. Does anybody know? Historians of Victorian England? We'll say yes. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely are part of the same networks. There's no doubt about that. They're definitely citing each other. Uh, Stephen Shapin, who was here in the fall, he wrote a nice uh, review of a book by, uh, of a biography of Spencer. He said, Spencer's known as a social Darwinist, but it might be even more accurate to call Darwin, a biological Spencerian. <laughs> I think mean, that's kind of a useful formula. Like so much in Schaefer or other people, you got to take it with a grain of salt, but it definitely is worth quoting in a lecture like this. Okay, the other plane, what I, have is, what I have is these two planes sort of sutured together through the binding of a kind of book, so it's a bit uh, flimsy, I would say, is what I think is being um, picked up by Zimmel in the same period with the focus on life in the 1890s, right up through his death in his very final work called View of Life, in fact, as a sociological vitalism of sort, um, a, a kind of formalism, which he calls sociability, operating through the principle of differentiation, and combined making a, what he calls sociation, Fehrgesellschaftung, 
you might call that socialization, but it's sort of like how humans form and shape themselves uh, through um, the process of being social beings. And what I've done there is sort of re, I've sort of uh, try to present that through this, through this uh, binding or folding or propping, what Freud called an unlinuk, a kind of leaning or propping of the needs and the instincts on the one hand at the level or the plane of nature and at the level of desires and drives on the other hand. So that's uh, um, part of another work that I'm trying to suture into this, uh, reading Jean Laplanche and Jacques Lacan through Freud and so on. But here I am trying to re-combine uh, that through a way of thinking of what is neoliberalism trying to do with nature on the one hand? Well, it doesn't take it as given, it takes it as material to be exploited, to be extorted, to be enhanced, to be um, mobilized, and um, the state on the other hand, um, the society on the other hand, which, which is already a bio-political, bio-social project. So what we might talk about a bit in the discussion, if you want, is to get further into this fifth part of uh, part five of the history of sexuality, where Foucault does set up a kind of somewhat crude, but really subtly in some ways formulated shift and tension between what he calls sovereign power on the one hand, which operates on the principle of take life and let live, so the menace of death, and biopower on the other hand, which he's just um, articulated through this bipolar process of the disciplines, the anatomical politics of the body on the one hand, at the level of the individual you might say, and uh, the biopolitics of the population, regulatory controls, with some, somewhat like what he later calls governmentality on the other. The principle there is not the menace of death as much as it is the management of life, okay? So that's what he means by this, this kind of subtle shift to biopower, okay? That's uh, your undergraduate version that you can all use for your theses or articles or cocktail parties or whatever, okay? Okay, I want to end with just a few very brief remarks on why I'm calling this the biosocial sources or roots of neoliberalism. Um, neoliberal biosociality. And here since the, since the 1990s, um, in the work of, of uh, Sarah Franklin, Nicholas Rose, um, John Connolly, uh, Paul Rabineau, and others, um, there's an interest in how this, this, how we're actually moving, seem to be moving beyond uh, this bipolar technology that Foucault identifies as being deployed, invented and deployed in the 19th century. So individual rights and communal entitlements are now the, the form the basis of a kind of biological citizenship. So a citizenship based on race and sex rather than class and status, on illness and age, um, in which individuals are defined in terms of their somatic physicality, their somatic materialism. And cure and care are themselves part of the projects of normalization and self-enhancement. So this is what I just wanted to leave us with, was this uh, comment by Nicholas Rose from a, ninth, from a 2000 article um, but later became the basis for a book with the same title, uh, The Politics of Life Itself. I'm quoting from the article, by the, not the book here. And he writes, if discipline individualizes and normalizes, and biopower collectivizes, ethopolitics concerns itself with the self-techniques by which human beings should judge themselves and uh, uh, judge themselves and act upon um, themselves to make themselves better than they are. In advanced neoliberal democracies, neoliberalism wasn't so fashionable as a term, critical or otherwise back then, so I added that. Uh, biological identity becomes bound up with more general norms of enterprising, self-actualizing, responsible 
personhood. Individuals who identify themselves and their community through their biology challenge the vectors that lead from biological imperfection or abnormality to stigmatization and exclusion. They demand civil and human rights for those whose lives previously were deemed less worthy of life. As somatic, embodied individuals engage with vital politics, a new ethics of life is taking shape. This is typical of the kind of manifesto rhetoric of uh, some of Nicholas Rose's work. It was a new piece. He just, it just came out in Theory, Culture, and Society with updates this in terms of what he calls the human sciences in the age of biology. Biology understood as a field of scientific knowledge, but also as a substance of vital reality. And sort of updating what Foucault calls the era of biopower into the age of biology, identity, self, community, uh, uh, referred to our neuro and biological existence. So what, so what concerns Rose and Rabineau with this latest phase of biopower, beyond discipline, beyond regulatory controls, but incorporating those as well, is the moral and medical problematization of life as itself a strategy of accumulation by dispossession, primitive accumulation in Marx's terms of biocapital and bio value itself. It's a reinvention um, of an entrepreneurial self uh, which is induced to engage in new strategies of self-management, self-organizing, <coughs> self-governance. And that's all. Thank you.